So we go out and we try and find the latest pieces of the cutting edge um, software and we try and find ways that we can apply that in the course of our craft of reporting, of reporting stories. So we use things like Node, Excel, we use things like i2, which is a, a social network analysis tool used by, by um, intelligence agencies. And we use that to then map individuals, companies, the relationships between them, even communication. It's the kinds of things that people use when they go and they do due diligence on a company or they track, for example, millions of emails through a large multi uh, multinational organization to see who's a leak and who's not a leak or to track kind of internal fraud or crime in those organizations. We now are starting to apply some of those same tools on the other side of the, of the, the kind of the boundary and applying that to track down organized crime, to track political funding, for example, or coming back to examples like um, British arms dealing in, in the rest of the world, to track how the money flows from various safe havens to eventually land up in a politician's pocket somewhere. But your behavior, where you socialize, who you socialize with, how you shop, what you read, is being tracked by someone somewhere. And I think that people using any of those social kinds of systems need to accept that. And if they don't like it, they need to take measures to protect themselves against it. And there are tools out there to protect yourself. Everything from something like Placebook, which you're able to centralize your data and allow kind of or set, uh, uh, grade the settings of what you're allowed to go out into the public space to using proxies. Um, information, personal information is becoming the new currency of the web. And this is what information companies, specifically here in Silicon Valley, are basing their business models on. People no longer want to pay for information. They don't want to subscribe to a local newspaper or an information source. So effectively what they're doing is they're buying access by surrendering some of their privacy. And the companies who take that information are using that to calibrate the kinds of advertising that's directed at them and various other third party offers. So journalists are increasingly going to, and media investigators are increasingly going to start using some of the same metrics to track the people that we track organized crime and politicians and so forth and see who they're associating with. Publishers are going to start using a lot of that same information which they've always used in an analog kind of form from subscription databases, um, where you live when your newspaper is delivered. They've sold that to advertisers. They're simply becoming more detailed and more nuanced about it and that's becoming the new currency that they're going to have to use to sustain the business model behind media and journalism. I'm with a forum for investigative reporting in Africa and um, what we noticed in Africa is that a lot of us are doing fairly interesting work but we're all confined to our newspapers and we don't have the resources or the time to really pursue stories across international borders and although a lot of people outside of Africa see Africa as one place, it's actually 52 nations. So organized crime, politics, donor funding, even foreign governments, a lot of the real impacts and a lot of the real trends are invisible to people who just concentrate on their small patch of turf. So what we've done through the forum is we've created a self-help association of senior investigative writers across the continent who now through this effective union in a way um, are starting to collaborate on stories. We don't have the money that a New York Times or a Guardian would have. So the idea is rather to get small people contributing or pooling their funding and their time. And we're able to achieve many of the same successes and operate at some of the same level that these very large media companies do internationally. So what we're doing is we're not really getting journalists from the same economy or the same market to collaborate with each other. We're getting journalists who are compete, not competing with each other. They're from completely different hemispheres in some cases, otherwise other parts of the continent. And yes, we are saying that if you collaborate, you've got to have simultaneous publication. So if we're collaborating with someone from The Guardian and it's someone from The Mail and Guardian in South Africa, there would be simultaneous publication on the same day, but to completely different readerships and different markets. And why does a journalist want to do that? Because the resulting story is of such magnitude and such size that they would have not been able to do it on their own. But more importantly, a piece that they might have published in the UK that might have caused a few ripples there is now simultaneously published in five or six other countries across the world and you start building such great impact that it starts getting momentum and the story grows far quicker and far wider than it would have if you'd been a lone wolf.